So my name is, uh, is Mandla Ngomo. Um, I work for IITA, and IITA is one of the centers uh, of the CG that is um, uh, part of the consortium of centers that is implementing uh, the Excellence in Agronomy Initiative. Uh, to kick us off, I, I am going to, to ask my, my colleague and um, our initiative lead, uh, Dr. Bernard uh, Van Lau, to come and give some initial reflections. Um, his role within uh, the initiative is, pro is uh, initiative lead, but is also a deputy uh, director general for the IITA and currently acting director general. Uh, Bernard is a soil scientist uh, with a lot of experience in um, trying to resolve some of the, the challenges that we face on the African continent around how do we help farmers get more from the labor that they, they deploy. So Bernard, I'm going to ask you to come and uh, just give uh, some initial uh, keynote reflections, uh, and then we, we invite uh, our colleagues to share some of the work that we've been doing as excellence in agronomy. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Mandla. I will sit down with your permission. Welcome to this event, which is co-organized with uh, FARA. As Mandla was saying, I'm a soil scientist. For, um, I think, about, let's say, more than 20 years, I started working on, on agronomy in Africa. It's actually almost more than 30 years, but anyway, a long time ago. And when you're very long in a certain environment, you know, things become routine. So you need to always find those new things to do. In the earlier days, we started working on agroforestry. Then uh, five years later, we started working on what we call balanced nutrient management systems, which is now called ISFM. Then we started generating ISFM principles and so on. So a long story. But today, I'm really happy to be here leading excellence in agronomy because I'm convinced that now we are doing the right type of agronomy. We have the tools available to do the right type of agronomy. And I think we are also having the partnerships in place to actually deliver outcomes and results. So for me, as uh, having been long in this field, it's been a refreshing experience to lead this initiative. I was also giving some talking points. Usually I write speeches myself, but now somebody is helping me to write speeches. So today it's about climate resilient and resource efficient systems. We want to explore and showcase um, the potential that agronomy has to deal with these important challenges. We heard about an action plan, I think yesterday it was, between FARA and, and the CGIR. And to be honest, we started talking with FARA, I think one year ago, I think well before the action plan on how do we as at least you know, agree and work together in the context of agronomy. We have four ways forward, and I'm very happy to see that they are very much aligned to the overall action plan. So we are also using this as an opportunity to thank FARA to have engaged with us and to continue working on implementing our own, our own action plan. So this initiative, as I said, we are absolutely committed to fostering climate change adaptations through advancement in soil health, yield, uh, water use efficiency and nutrient use efficiency. You see the, the indicators on the right panel. We call it agronomic gain delivery. Um, I think we all heard or the world knows about genetic gain. And we in Excellence in Agronomy started coining the term agronomic gain. So if you use a new term, then people ask you, but what is this? What are you trying to do? So you need to start defining it. And I think we are making good progress in, in defining what we mean with agronomic gain. And, and of course, together with that genetic gain, that's how we will, he will make those changes that, uh, that are needed. So in this session, you will see contributions from collaborations, how we can promote some of the solutions that we are working on. Um, we have a very nice lineup of demonstrations and discussions that will show the potential of those tools and how we can further scale them. Um, thanks a lot to all the partners we have been working with. It's been a um, very nice experience. 
thanks to the speakers and the people that were ready to spend time here. I think together we will absolutely agree on the next steps. So please, everyone in the room, share your experiences. Make sure that we learn also from all of you. And uh, again, uh, big welcome to everyone, also the people online. You're very much welcome. Let's create connections, learn from each other, and pave the way so we can really help delivering this uh, resilient agriculture that we are all looking for. Enjoy the meeting, enjoy the conversation, and thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Bernard, for, for those opening remarks. Uh, Bernard will uh, ask to be excused because he's also speaking at, a, uh, at another side event that is talking about soils and, uh, and soil health. Um, but like he has said, um, the reason why we are here is to, is to start a conversation. And the conversation is, uh, after more than 50 years of uh, huge investments in agricultural research, why is it that a lot of the solutions that we are coming up with are not getting to farmers? I think what was shared this morning and yesterday about the action plan uh, talks to the need for different actors to work together in order to advance you know, the delivery of solutions to farmers. Uh, the CG can't do it on their own. And what we are learning and learning very fast is that if we're not putting farmers at the center of the conversation, we're probably missing a few points. Uh, so it is important for us to assemble uh, the coalition of the willing, I'm going to borrow a term that my colleagues will talk about just now, where we are bringing together those of us that are passionate about ensuring that each and every farmer on the African continent the 20 or 25 decisions they need to make every year when they think about cropping, how do we influence those decisions in a positive direction? So we need partnerships. Not only the CG needs to play a role, but we also need entities like some of those that will be speaking later who assemble the actors that engage in research that also engage in delivering advisory services. But we thought it was important to start off uh, our event today by maybe showcasing some of the work that is already taking place within the CG in terms of generating and developing the solutions. So to do that, we've invited um, three uh, groups of people uh, that we call use case teams. Uh, within excellence in agronomy, a use case is where we are assembling CG partners and non-CG partners to co-create a solution, validate it, pilot it, and scale it uh, to large numbers of farmers. So we've got three use cases that are represented here today, and I'm going to invite um, uh, the colleagues that are representing those use cases uh, to, to come up and maybe share some of the work that, uh, that they've been doing. Uh, the, the first group that I would like to, to invite to come uh, is uh, my brother uh, Lulseget, uh, who is uh, uh, leading a use case in, uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, that use case, we normally call it Digital Green because the demand partner uh, is Digital Green, uh, who are represented by my sister uh, Megdesh who is here as well today, and I would like them to spend 15 minutes walking us through the journey that they've taken in developing this solution, in validating it, in deploying it at scale, and what some of the opportunities exist for our colleagues from uh, AFAS, from Azareka, and from Kadesa to, to help us or to work with us in terms of taking these solutions to, to scale. So please, um, if you could come up, uh, uh, Lulz, and uh, here's the, uh, the clicker. Uh, you'll be able to, to maybe walk the audience through some of the work that you've done. Uh, here's your, here's the microphone. Uh, thank you, Vandla. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this session uh, after late lunch. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, as Mandla said, I will present briefly our use case, which is called Digital Green Use Case, which is about developing a location-specific disease support tool 
for agro-advisory decision making, and I'm representing our team in Ethiopia plus Magdes here, who joined from Vista Green. Thanks, Magdes, for coming. Because we have 15 minutes, we agreed that I will talk and she will support uh, doing a question and answer. So, um, so we call it Digital Green Use Case and, uh, in, in our setup and location context and season specific agro advisory system that we have developed. So, I will take you through the, the steps. The, the first one, the problem we have, uh, as more of most of you know, is a huge yield gap. Uh, when you compare uh, some of the African countries with uh, uh, other countries in the world, like there is a huge gap up to 40% and sometimes more, more than 40%. And within Ethiopia itself, there is a big uh, yield gap where we have farmers mostly produce up to 2.5 uh, ton per hectare, while the, the potential is from six to, to seven. So this is an observed uh, problem. And the reason behind is, there are so many reasons, but one of the fundamental reasons is limited use of input, including fertilizer. Of course, climate change and agronomic management are also issues, but uh, fertilizer use, as you can see, in most of the African countries is very low compared to the global and some of the regional use. So there is a huge correlation between the observed yield gap and the agronomic practices, including the fertilizer use. So our use case is trying to uh, determine how we can reduce that yield gap by developing advisories that are location specific. So something has happened. I think there was some change, yeah. Something has happened there. Eh? So anyway, so one of the key problems here is that fertilizer application, even though the amount is smaller, is also blanket, irrespective of the agroecological zones, the farming systems, the topographic setup we have. So in, in our use case, we have developed a fertilizer decision support tool that can enable applying a given uh, amount of fertilizer and time of uh, fertilizer for each location. And the tool is automated already where we have all the processes are documented from, uh, so I cannot move. So, yeah, okay, so this, the, so I, this I mentioned already, so, good, so, <coughs> sorry, so this is the, the, the DC support tool that we have developed by, uh, to guide our fertilizer advisory, as you can see on the, which is not clear, on the top part, there are options to choose, whether you have organic input, inorganic input, agro other agronomic practices, including mechanization and so on and so forth, and users can choose the specific, in this, in this section, they have options to choose a country, a region, zone, or a recovery, and so on, and they can have uh, the amount of fertilizer they have to apply and the expected yield, and it produces also an automated report for the users. So a person can choose their own area, or they can have administrative unit to, to integrate, to, to get that advisory. And in addition, we have this advisory, which also supports uh, the onset of rains and planting dates which is integrated from another advisory system that we have developed in collaboration with national and other partners. So this means within this use case, we can provide information on when is the probability of rain, when should the farmers plant that specific crop, and how much input they have to apply, and when, the including the fertilizer application, timing and rates. Then, sorry. <laughs> then the, Oh, okay, so how we did, how we reached there is the first one, as you see, data and database, where Mandela mentioned about position of the willing. First, we have to get the data sets that are available because we cannot keep on doing experiments and trials every year without knowing what we have already. So we formed a coalition of the willing where team members in the country who are agronomy soil data brought together, came together and brought their own data sets and we have a database that's available at the Ministry of Agriculture and at EIR. That's the first uh, set. Then we have also the covariate. So these are 
fertilizer response to crop data set for different crops in Ethiopia. These are about 45,000, including the major crops, wheat, barley, maize, tape, and so on. And these are the covariates that we have collected, and this is stored in this data set. Ministry of Agriculture, for all agriculture-related data sets, EIAR, the National Research Institute, is research-related data sets. Then we used a lot of machine learning and artificial intelligence approach to combine this and develop a fertilizer recommendation for each location, either in, tab in tabular form, <laughs> in map, or you know, the total amount that we can. Then we worked with Digital Green and other partners to disseminate the information to farmers. So the alignment here is we work on the content creation, and Digital Green and other partners work on disseminating that advisory to farmers. Then an important intervention is also the feedback loop, because most of the time, we provide only linear recommendations to farmers and we collect feedback from the farmers about what the observations are, then we have embedded that through the digital green system. So this, uh, we presented this uh, exercise in uh, a Sareka meeting in Uganda a few weeks ago, and it was very interesting discussion we make where we can scale this exercise to other African countries or in within Africa. We can form a coalition of the willing within Africa if we want to scale whatever technologies we have and reach in millions. Yesterday, there ma it was mentioned that we cannot work now with the small numbers. If we have the big numbers to, to work with, then we need to have this partnership. Then this is a coalition which we have. So how it worked is data and database was contributed by the coalition of willing analytics and different partners supported on advisory channels. And we have different projects also. For example, we have excellence in agronomy, dominantly working on wheat use case, but also we have ECRA project is comporting, co co complementing now finance for maize, and we have now S, uh, X, the S, H, SIMFS, the sustainable, the sustainable Diversification Farming System one, who are contributing that for TEF. That means we are bringing different crops using different projects. Then, oh, sorry. Then the results. So we have piloted the work. So we have developed the, we have de collected data from different sources. We have organized the database. We conducted analytics and we have results. As you can see, these are per observations of the ground where there are big gaps between the advisories that we used and the blanket recommendation by the government system. So you can see here, for example, in the validation, we used 280 farmers to validate uh, the results, the advisories that we have and there is up to 25, uh, 24% gain compared to the blanket recommendation. In partial profit, generally we can say profitability because the experiments that we used are more or less similar in terms of cost in labor, wedding, and so on. We have around $580 per hectare per season, which is very significant compared to whatever is happening. Now, based on that exercise with Digital Green, the, we piloted that advisory over 3,000 farmers 3,200 farmers, and the, we gained yield of more than 38% when you compare the yield that was acquired from the farmers who employed the advisory versus the farmers who didn't apply, who used their own management practices. This was also a very significant milestone. Then the results, you know, in, ter in terms of the impact, we have farmers' testimonials, where a lot of farmers we have interviews, videos, and so on, where they have indicators that they are very happy with the advisory and the yields they have got, with except some challenge of in acquiring the fertilizer and in some cases the cost, because our advisory is a, bit, a little bit higher than what they usually apply. Distri district level agriculture offices appreciated the performance and they have asked to scale, and even they have, we have received from all areas where we have worked a certificate of appreciation, we are very happy with, the, with whatever they have seen and they have asked it to scale and digital green now with a formal request from the different places we are expanding over large number of farmers and this year i think we'll do more than uh, 15 or 20000 the ministry of agriculture uh, has already started adopting or implementing this advisory over the whole partnership of course over their clusters there is a clustering system in the ministry of agriculture by ati and they are scaling from 2023 this season and the partnership means they are very happy with the, how we operate with excellence in agronomy framework with the digital green we don't duplicate efforts we have the content they validate the content and they take it to the farmers through the digital the ds 
Then the last one is um, they have also given an instruction or guidance on how we, next, we take it to the next level for scaling. The state minister, we have presented with the state minister about a month ago, and he has given a direction and how we, how we have to scale or package into the extension package through working the AIR, and we have started that discussion with Digital Green. And this season, AIR, independently, are going to validate the, the advisory, because we showed our validation, but in principle, they cannot just accept, oh, okay, you gave me and take the extension. So they said we have to provide them resources, and they have to do it independently. So around five sites are identified, 50 or so farmers, and we hope that will go through, and we are very sure it will, it will go through. So these are some of the gains. And next steps, I think what is important in this exercise and uh, excellence in agronomy is the work workflow is automated. And you know the whole the data cleaning, data quality assurance, the harmonization, and the advisory development is automated, and all the programs and codes are freely available. So even now, we are moving to a system called AgWise that can be applicable widely across different countries. Then the, the partnership along the data value chain or the data ecosystem is very important. And an example in Ethiopia is where we have the coalition of the willing, 150 people collaborating in, uh, sorry, in uh, contributing data sets. And we have experts even to do any analytics if we are interested, in addition to the excellence in agronomy. Then the dissemination channel, we have different partners, in including the digital green, the extension system, Lersha and other private sectors who are, who are planning to engage with this exercise. So we can prioritize on need-based, expert-based uh, partnership so that we can facilitate the scaling. Human-centered design is key. Uh, I think this is very important and we have identified in our field exercises that necessarily farmers may not only worry about the amount of fertilizer they have to apply, but also the availability. So we are now moving to bundling on insurance and credit because they have indicated that the advisor is very good, but the problem is where do they get that fertilizer. So we are working on that up with Digital Green and Lersha. Regional organizations, for example, like uh, FARA and others can support in coordinating and uh, taking this uh, excellence in agronomy product to scale across the different countries by piloting first in different environments. Then we have, uh, the, as I mentioned, the tailoring and bundling is one step that we are going to do because farmers have so many issues to, to resolve and we, we, they, only, they don't need only fertilizer but other additional things like the planting and so on are incorporated but they have asked for disease surveillance tools, uh, credit as I mentioned and insurance. Then capacity building is key across the whole value chain and we have trained more than 500 people including the farmers, the field days and events, and we have publications, because for the uh, young people to contribute their data, we have to build their capacity and incentivize them through supporting and publishing their documents. So we have worked with different partners, as you can see, private uh, sector, government, and GOCGR centers, and so on. These are the only ones, but the 150 coalition of the willing members are represented by this one. This is to make sure that we have 150 people, but sometimes we may mention few, and the remaining maybe may not be happy. So what we said <laughs> is we have developed an independent logo that represents the 150 people. So by representing that time, that means all are represented <laughs> and well accounted. Uh, thank Fantastic. you very much for your time. <laughs> thank thanks, you very much. Thanks, Luz. Thank you so much. So, so I, think, I think you can see from, uh, from the presentation from Luz, I guess, the, the process that has taken place. But I, I think uh, with your permission, I would like us to stay still in Ethiopia uh, and, and also hear a slightly different approach that has been led uh, largely from the, the team from ICRISAT. Uh, and my, my brother Giza Odesta is here to also share uh, some of the work that they've done. And then we're going to allow for a quick Q&A uh, after the third presentation before we now bring our, our esteemed colleagues uh, to, to, to give us their reaction and then to start a conversation about how do we make scaling work. Uh, now Gizau is, um, is one of the teams, uh, is leading a team uh, also in Ethiopia that's working with, uh, within ICRISAT where they are trying to scale up um, uh, some more technologies around soil health management and fertilizer, and fertilizer uh, recommendations. Over to you. Thank you, Marla. Uh, good afternoon. 
Uh, my name is Guzao Desta. I work for Ecrisat, uh, Ethiopia office. And I, my, my role is mainly on landscape management. And uh, in the AI use case, I'm also facilitating the fertilizer drip AI use case. So I'm going to present uh, the same uh, way what uh, Digital Green present, how we, we, we uh, develop the fertilizer decision tool uh, uh, for three crops. Okay, uh, I, I think our use case is mainly uh, uh, designed to solve uh, what, what uh, Munsegger mentioned, the yield gap and the nutrient deficiency. Uh, especially we focus here on the uh, two factors, the environment factor and the management factor, especially the management factor that fertilizer uh, contributes for yield gap uh, and the environment factor in our case is we consider landscape as another factor that, that contribute for the reduction of yield. So uh, our decision support tool is mainly focused to address yield gap that contributed from the variability of yields in the landscape as well as uh, due to the management, especially fertilizer and some agronomic practices. And the uh, the second uh, problem that uh, uh, our use uh, DCT uh, will, uh, uh, I mean, uh, help to solve is the uh, adoption because uh, because of the blanket recommendation of fertilizer in the country, most of the farmers they, they are not able to afford in one, on one hand, on the other hand, the recommendations are not really uh, at their at their requirement at the specific requirement where they are. Uh, uh, doing uh, farming, so because of that, uh, that is a huge problem for low adoption. So uh, if we look at some of the, the, the graphs there, uh, sorry, uh, the graph there, no, it's not showing, the, 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 left, the right side, uh, if we look at the, the whole research in the national system, where they are now doing fertilizer research. If you look at the slope and uh, the number of experiments, of the, I mean, uh, uh, on-farm experiments, most of the, the, the NARS people, they do research in lower slopes in where the, there is flat land or where uh, there is uh, a more uniform uh, fields. So that, that recommendation coming from that kind of research is not really uh, uh, helping for those farmers uh, who are uh, doing um, uh, farming at marginal lands. So uh, that is really a big gap for the adoption. So we want to really respond for that uh, in this uh, uh, DSET or use case. So the solution is, uh, we have one solution. I mean, we have one DSET, but when we look at the, the, the users of those, this DSET, we, we divide into three components. The first one is a landscape specific fertilizer application for sorghum, F and wheat. Uh, this is because uh, our data is based on landscape. We, we collect a, a huge data set uh, following this landscape sequence. I mean, we have data on the uh, marginal land, in the middle, and the flat land. So based on that crop response data, we develop our decision support tool. And this decision support tool is very localized because we fragmented or we segment, uh, I mean, use this segment of landscapes as a unit of analysis. And another one is uh, because it is very much uh, relevant for the farmers because uh, when we have this segmentation of land, uh, we, we consider farm typology or at parcel level, the variability at parcel level and the variability at landscape level. So it's a solution very relevant for the farmers. That is very important. And another one is uh, we also uh, uh, have the, the solution at localized agronomy solution uh, because we build on this very sp uh, context specific case. So this is one of the solution where uh, we say that it's very localized landscape specific fertilizer application for the three uh, crops. So it is very farmer-centered and extension agent-centered uh, solution. 
And again, uh, this one is the, the advisory tool that we developed. We already developed uh, an advisory, this advisory tool that we follow, uh, uh, I mean, a part, I mean, data uh, manipulation and data analysis, and then we developed a prototype and we do that validation and now at piloting level. We already completed the piloting level. So we developed API from that data and that API, uh, from that API, we, we can have the application, mobile application, and the SMS, Telegram, and WhatsApp group. So we have already this tool uh, two years before, and then we go for the validation, and then piloting. So that is the second product that uh, in, this, in this fertilizer use case. And the third one is, uh, the third solution is, you know, this process is very important for, for uh, 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 scaling innovation. So we work with partners at local level. I will I'll come back to that uh, later on. So this is a very important solution that we, we, we got through the process. So we have a user-centered approach and engaging many scaling network partners in this process. So that is one, one solution. When I come back to uh, the approach that we follow, sorry, Yeah, the first one is, I think, how we develop the content, how we uh, uh, drive the demand from the, the uh, uh, partners or from the users of this. So this is very important. We engage the experts at local level, at district level. We engage extension agents at district level, and we engage farmers at, at local level, and we are trying to uh, uh, understand the context and understand the content, what content they are going to use, uh, uh, interested. So these discussions were uh, 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 conducted in different parts of the country where we are working because our data was generated from uh, uh, 2014 at landscape level. So since that time, uh, we have a lot of data. So we need, we need to gather all the context where we are doing uh, those experiments. And uh, hap having this discussion, I think we are, we are trying to understand what the content the experts need what the content the far, uh, farmers are needing, especially if you look at this, uh, this figure, uh, we are collecting information from the farmers how the current fertilizer used at long landscape. So they, they, they apply more fertilizer on hill slopes, hill, hill slopes, and then uh, a little bit lower on the mid slopes, and uh, on the flat and the bottom land, they, they apply low because they want to, uh, they expect more response on degraded soils, so they, they apply more. But in terms of economics, that's not working. So this is the, uh, the, the context that we found when we discussed with the farmers. So this is the content of the, our decisions. And then once we have this content, as, as, as uh, Lutzeger mentioned, we follow the same procedure. I mean, we, we have this uh, co-design uh, approach that means what, where and how. So we, we use more than 24,000 uh, 24, crop response data for the three crops. And we, we do, uh, anal uh, do analytics and then uh, we have a validation and piloting and co-piloting together with the, uh, our partners at the district level. We, we start from the lower. I think we, I call it bottom up co-development approach. Uh, because we, we, we start from the ground with the grassroots uh, uh, users and uh, with local uh, district implementers. So we have this approach that we followed and we do co-validation, co-piloting uh, in 10 districts along, uh, in three regional states. And the scaling network, the innovation, I think uh, our, our innovation is centering, uh, center the extension agents. Because in Ethiopia, the extension agent is very important partner for agriculture. Because they are working at lower level, at Kabale level, and at least they reach 200 to 400 farmers uh, within, within the Kabale. And this, these extension agents are facing different partners. That's why we are, we are uh, uh, focusing on, on, on this partnership. So extension agents, they face with the research, they face with uh, different uh, service providers, they face uh, up to the district and to national level and the farmers. But when, uh, so this is a very inclusive, uh, uh, I mean, because when we consider extension agents, they are facing different partners, so they are very 
inclusive of different. So this is the innovation stage. But uh, if we look at this network, I mean, the extension agent, they have a development group. Uh, uh, there are within the farmers who have devel development group in Yakavali. So in that Kavali, at least 10 to 20 uh, development groups. And within that development group, there is one lead five follower farmers approach. So the, the one to five, you see the lead farmer and the extension agents are our target user groups. So we focus our approach on these two groups. And then uh, uh, the district where we have some operational level, uh, 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 operational level uh, partnership and then the national for scaling and for policy level uh, uh, approach. So this is, uh, I think the lower one is the innovation, uh, innovation stage and the uh, upper one is the uh, scaling stage that we are uh, doing. But I think it's not only that, we have, uh, I, will, I will come back to that later on, but we have also a community of practice. I will show you how, how we develop. So the another, another uh, solution is the feedback mechanism. We have different mechanisms where we collect feedback for this. The first one is with farmers on the field during the, the validation, during the uh, uh, piloting. We have field days. We have every, every time regular supervision. So we have meetings with the uh, experts. We have joint supervision and evaluation with the research system. So a lot of team work in, the, in, that, in that case. So we have uh, that kind of feedback. And we also collect testimonies from farmers. We have videos during the field days where we collect feedback from the, the farmers, from the experts, from the researchers. So this is another uh, uh, feedback mechanism. But the most important that we used really in our process is the community of practice. Uh, we, we have uh, different districts. For each district, we have one community of practice that is using social media. So those are very strong uh, uh, feedback mechanisms. Every feedback and knowledge exchange, everything we got uh, through this approach. So when com I come to the results, I think the agronomic and economic gain uh, we can see that in the validation stage, we have this uh, yield increase, 29% for short gum, 17%, and 30%. Imagine this is along the landscape. That includes the marginal land in the hill slope. So you, you, ca you cannot imagine a flat land where wheat is growing or F is growing. So this is uh, considering all the landscape conditions, we, we got this much amount of yield gain compared to the blanket recommendation, of course. And uh, yeah, this is also the yield gain, the net benefit from F and the best uh, benefit to cost ratio. I think that is ve ve very important indicator for us, the benefit to cost ratio. Because when we discuss with farmers, we got those uh, agronomic efficiency that I showed you. At the end of the, the, the validation and the piloting, what we are checking is whether we have uh, uh, an equal benefit to cost ratio along the landscapes, along the three landscapes, the hill slope, foot slope, and the mid slope. If we have some uh, uh, more or less equal benefit to cost ratio, then that means we attain our objective because the, the farmers, they, they have a, a lot of economic loss when they, f they add fertilizer on the hill slopes. So we want to optimize that, that application and investment. So. Another, I think I already mentioned is a localized agronomic solution. What I mean is, because when we discuss with partners, they are not only talking about fertilizer, but they are talking about the seed rate, the planting rate along the landscape, the cropping system along the landscape. So we, we are learning a lot uh, in this process. So the, the experts and the extension agents and the farmers in this process, they are learning a lot how agronomy at local level looks like and they are really uh, 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 interested on this. And the other one is influence the National Research and Exchange Service. Uh, I think this is very important also in data management and using digitalized fertilizer application. In the Ethiopian in the NARS system, uh, digital solutions are not yet uh, in, uh, in, in part of the research. So this is very important learning for them. But it's not uh, only the data management and the uh, fertilizer uh, uh, digital solutions. But I think 
I was, I was in the national system. So what, what we did in the national system, we develop a technology, and then we, when we have a final output, we provide that to the extension system. But now in this case, we have uh, a participatory technology development. We engage the extension, the farmers, and the research together at the, at the beginning of the, the, the research. So that is an important uh, uh, the result that we found. And another one is innovation scaling network. Of course, in this network, we are also creating new demands from other new partners. So that is, I think, in the national system, we, we talk a lot, and there are new, new demands coming, uh, not only for fertilizer, but other demands. So that is another uh, impact that we, we, we observe it. And of course, the agronomic, the optimized nutrient management, uh, that that's very important the, for the current situation, especially the fertilizer price is uh, a big problem. So the next step, I think uh, we are already uh, planning this time. Our colleagues are on the field. All the, the districts, they, they want to expand and they want to scale. So that is uh, one of the, uh, our next step. We want to reach, actually because of the fertilizer price, many farmers are not really uh, voluntary to, to engage in this process, but we are still pushing with the districts to scale to wider areas. And another is to integrate with agro agronomic other agronomic advisories, especially land management and soil health. Because we are, we are, we are dealing on the landscape, the hill slopes, they are still low yielding area. So we want to really complement with other land management practices so that like organic farming or land management practice so that we have some uh, 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 improvement in the, in the agronomic response. Yeah, strengthening, scaling and digital solution at national level that Lutsek had already mentioned, we have working uh, at national level for one uh, uh, national platform, digital national platform. So uh, we have that kind of platform in the future and then we already started the discussion how we make that national uh, platform as, as a scaling platform for, for uh, both of the DSCTs. Okay. And of course, support research and development in fertilizer. I think currently this season, for example, the national research system, they launch many fertilizer research trials and uh, we are supporting all that. And we need to really support that kind of, so that we our decision tools are uh, improved uh, in future. And the final slide, I yep. think. You need uh, to wrap up now. Yeah, <laughs> the final slide, uh, I think, uh, in Ethiopia, I think we work a lot on fertilizer response. So I think our DCCs are very useful for other countries. Uh, and uh, we need to really find them in, in, in areas where, in, in countries where, uh, especially where they, 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 they have these soil maps. So it, the, these DCCs are useful to refine those soil maps. So uh, uh, really, uh, we, can, we can expand on other countries and create awareness of the DCT tools, get the demand partners and support the validation and fine timing uh, in, in, in uh, other countries. And we need to really bring different partners together to work on this. And finally, especially, uh, I think, especially for these regional initiatives, we want to really integrate and plan an action for, for uh, testing and scaling these uh, DCTs uh, because uh, we are, we are discussing now in Tanzania with our uh, uh, another partners how we can really use this DCT in Tanzania and so on. So I think uh, these are some of the recommendations that we have. Thank you very much, Ivan. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Kizau. Um, I, I, I think uh, if you are as, as, as old of s as some of us in the room, it is really exciting to, to see the agricultural development that's taking place in Ethiopia. You remember that uh, when Dr. Adeshina was also speaking yesterday, he made a point about the fact that Ethiopia, for the first time, is moving in the direction of wheat self-sufficiency and might actually be exporting for the first time this year. Uh, that did not happen by accident. Some of what uh, my colleagues have just shared now are the efforts that I think have contributed. But we've got a mandate that we've been given by our seniors yesterday to say, 20,000 farmers is not scaling. So as you are sitting there, I would like you to be thinking about how are we going to move beyond these islands of success in Ethiopia to a sea of change, you know, across the entire African continent. 
for me, that's what uh, keeps me awake at night. But I want us to move a little bit further down the Rift Valley. Uh, so we've been to Ethiopia now. We are moving down. We are passing Kenya through the Rift Valley. And we are getting to the warm heart of Africa uh, in Malawi, uh, Zambia, and Mozambique. And I'd like my colleague, uh, you know, Dr. Isaiah Nyagumbo, to share one last example of the work that is being done uh, in Malawi, Mozambique, and, and, uh, and uh, Zambia around soybean. Because it's not only about staple crops, but it's also about some of these industrial crops. So over to you, I Isaiah. The audience is, is wondering what are you doing different or how are you complementing what uh, Lulz and uh, Giza have just shared? Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, my name is Isaiah Nyagumbo. I'm from CIMIT. Um, this presentation is co-shared with a, a colleague, uh, Shungu Kanyemba, who is seated there. So if I start stam stammering, please, uh, I'll let him take over and uh, uh, continue with the presentation. Okay. Um, yes, what are we talking about? We're talking about soya beans here. Uh, in this region. We are a new kid on the block. We just started uh, this work in the last year. Um, uh, some of the use cases that have been presenting have been around for a while. But really, what is the issue about soybean? Why stick to soybean? Why talk about soybean? I think IITA for years have been working on soybean. Um, and uh, it so happens that uh, soybean productivity in the region or output is rather low, uh, something like 861,000 metric ton. The demand exceeds 2 million. Regional production is uh, dominated by South Africa. Uh, more than 65% of it is coming from there. Low participation in uh, soy pro production by smallholder farmers due to poor policy support, uh, trade barriers, and uh, undeveloped markets. I think some of the issues that are being discussed in the next room. High cost of soybean seed. Uh, farmers are using recycled seed most of the time. Uh, the same seed over and over again. Farmers have low regard for use of fertilizers in general, uh, and uh, even let alone in inoculants. I remember talking uh, to some farmers in Malawi, talking about fertilizer in soybeans. They surprised put fertilizer in soybean. They really are surprised. So it's something that is very new to them. We're also talking about low adoption of technologies and, and farming practices, how to actually get the crop at the right plant population at the right time, and so on. These are issues that uh, also affect productivity of soybeans in Malawi. Uh, in most cases, we find that farmers are just using low plant populations, and uh, they can't get the yields there. We're looking at weak seed systems affected by poor uh, traceability that affects uh, your seed quality. So, um, having uh, looked at that, we said to ourselves, <coughs> how shall we uh, tackle this issue? What uh, are the key or what are the key characteristics of the needed solutions that we need to uh, focus on? And we felt like one of the interventions, one of the issues was that the interventions needed to align well with farmer priorities. They need to address current challenges in soy production in the Chinyanja Triangle. We also need to be focusing more on what I could call low-hanging fruits, uh, that is, they should be fairly easy to set, set up and implement. Then we also needed agronomic re recommendations that would be availed to farmers via some kind of mobile platform. I think yesterday we heard about the youth. The youth are no longer interested in the traditional ways of extension that we used many years ago. The youth are really keen on these digital uh, facilities. So if we can kind of avail this information via some mobile platforms, then uh, this should uh, uh, align well. Then we're looking at solutions that ideally should be validatable. In other words, can we test uh, their usefulness uh, once they are set up? Do, do we need Shungu to step in? <laughs> Not yet. I think we generally felt our solutions needed to be uh, focusing on the challenges identified by uh, farmers in the Solidaridad sites. 
Solidaridad is an NGO that is already working on soybean in, in the uh, Chinyanja Triangle. Looking at verification of the identified key challenges with experts. So this idea of co-creation that was also discussed yesterday is something that we have also taken very seriously. Brainstorming of solutions with stakeholders and ideation in workshops and the development of then what we would call priority uh, interventions. So, what have we kind of uh, settled for? All these issues is really what we kind of came up with. Uh, but the last five, six, and uh, seven, so links to output and input markets, uh, setting up services, planting, shelling, handheld machinery, and so on, pests and diseases, uh, the sort of uh, issues we kind of felt we couldn't tackle, but they were considered very, very, very important. Okay, so what did we settle for? Uh, we decided we wanted to have uh, an application that is run on a mobile phone that is simply addressing four main components. That is, what soybean variety can a farmer grow in a specific area? When can they plant it? What fertilizer should they use to grow it? And how can they grow it? So this tool we're envisaging that it will operate on the Akelimo framework so we're copying from our brothers from the north, um, and then we'll actually operate it on the Solidaridad Day framework, and it will uh, use some inputs from our uh, transform uh, colleagues. Uh, Can you uh, explain this one? Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Isaiah. Um, I think so. The relationship between uh, solidarity and EIA is one of uh, you know it's one of those uh, amazing relationships that came to be. We as solidarity, um, uh, which one is the the one that was the All right, so we are solidarity that um, for the past, um, from about 2017, have been working on what we call digitally driven uh, advisory. Uh, as uh, any NGO, we've uh, really mastered the art of taking farmers, putting them under trees, and, and explaining to them things. But having seen the technology revolution of what's happening in banking, we actually realized that the relationship between a farmer and uh, the organizations that work with them is actually going to become more digital. Uh, uh, what we're seeing in banking is also going to transform. So we've been working on um, this platform that we call the S-Cloud um, across all the regions that Solidarity is working at. And we've got so many different tools that we've got that collect data from farmers. Um, so we collect data such as, you know, the day that we register the farmer, we collect data about where they are, their fields, we map their fields. Uh, we actually collect data about the agronomic practices that they are doing. But what was missing uh, in this is that we could not actually process this data into an advisory. Uh, it is something that, you know, we are partnering with other private sector organizations to do that. So when um, the EIA came through, we said we definitely want to work with you. So the way that our system is, um, is designed is that we collect the data using uh, the tools that we've got there. There are many different tools. And each of our farmers has got something that we call a farmer ID. And that farmer ID, every time there's an interaction with Solidaridad, uh, we, we actually tag the data with that. So sometimes when you see a farmer profile, you can see 
uh, what their yield was, but that was collected at a different time from the day they were registered, when their field was registered, everything follows the farmer ID. But now with that data, we need the it then goes into a, s a system of consolidation, and after we consolidate it, we're using it for many different practices, for different purposes. We've got um, an internal corporate system that we call Plaza, where the data goes so that our partners across the network can see what's happening. We've got something that we call Pharma to Market, which is where you know this data then becomes visible to uh, potential buyers or produce. Then it goes also into another system called Malimpeu, which allows for loans to smallholder farmers and um, internal dashboards. Um, every day we're getting information about how many farmers have been trained, so forth, as well as. Now, what's interesting is something that we call Wadi. Wadi is a, a chatbot on WhatsApp. And uh, with what happens with Wadi is we're using Wadi for all sorts of things, such as um, giving farmers their understanding of their climate adaptation index, uh, giving them access to rewards programs and nudges. So now what we're doing is we're linking it to Akilima. Uh, this is where Isaiah and his brothers are helping us come up with some very important advisory, which then goes through our normal uh, system. So uh, we are really grateful for this. Thank you. Thank you, Shungu. Okay, so we continue. Uh, we've got uh, two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Yeah. We'll uh, rush it through. Had it not been for this, I would have finished. Okay, um, I think what I just wanted to bring to your attention is that uh, uh, we have noticed that there is um, a serious yield gap between what is obtainable and what is actually being realized from uh, farmers in the, in the uh, three countries, uh, in Malawi, Zambia, and Mozambique. The potential versus the actual uh, yields that are coming from the research stations uh, is very different and also from the uh, experiment. So there is a yet large yield gap to be closed and uh, there is a lot of work that we need to do. Uh, just move it, move it forward for me, please. Okay, so literature is also showing that if we use uh, phosphorus input, phosphorus input is very key. Uh, please move on. Um, and uh, also that uh, if we apply or use inoculants, we also go a long way. Something like 24% yield increase on average in the region is what is actually kind of emerging. Um, move on, please. <coughs> yes, and also then if we look at uh, varieties and planting date effects, we're talking about uh, the correct timing of planting being a very key factor, as much as 300% uh, yield variation between the correctly timed and the late plant, uh, planted crops. Farmers are already using mobile operated weather focus in the uh, Chinyanja Triangle, as you heard from uh, uh, Shungu uh, Kivuno are already working on that. So these farmers are already using their mobile op uh, phones to tell you what tomorrow is going to be like in terms of weather. Plant date and the variety experiments have also been established. As you can imagine, we are trying to also learn as we go and uh, get new information to feed into this model or this dream uh, application that we want to establish. Localized on-farm production of improved seeds by Solidaridad is already helping uh, to curb recycling of seed. So what you see in the picture here is already seed that is being produced by farmers uh, and selling uh, amongst themselves locally. Was it, was it you? Uh, it was not you, huh? Okay. Okay, so we're looking at uh, uh, lots of field experiments that have been established. About 180 farmers have already been involved in uh, uh, hosting some of these uh, ex experiments on farm. Um, nine on-station replicated experiments. We are working with NAS, uh, DAS, ZARI, and uh, IAM in Mozambique, uh, all involved uh, apart from the extension systems within uh, uh, the three countries. Uh, next, please. So our anticipated impact, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, uh, I, I hope you can spare me another minute. Uh, yes, <coughs> yes, we're looking at uh, this uh, uh, mobile uh, app being operational by 2024. We're also looking at uh, paper-based advisories. We realize that we probably can't wait until the 
uh, the, 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 the advanced mobile app is operational. So we're going to start with some paper-based advisories being availed to farmers uh, for a start. And then as we go, we get more and more sophisticated. We're also looking at about 150 farmers having been uh, involved directly uh, in 2022-23. By the next season, we are hoping to increase this number to 500. Uh, and hopefully by 2025, 30,000. And I think Mancha will still say that is not good enough uh, from what was said yesterday. But yeah, we are trying to, to get in that direction. And uh, yeah, the next step, I think, as you can imagine, I think this issue of uh, partnerships, 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 as I said this morning, uh, is key. I think we need more partnerships and players needed to address or embrace the solutions by uh, the regional organizations. Engagement of local stakeholders and policy uh, makers is a worthwhile investment toward, towards appropriate development of the use case ideas. I think really there we have a lot of scope to uh, work together, particularly those of us who are working uh, in this region. We also need more inclusive uh, of key value chain players and stakeholders. I think the is issue of uh, markets, uh, which uh, was talked about yesterday, uh, also being talked about in the other rooms, I think, uh, is something that I think we also need to address uh, even with respect to soybean. I think uh, this is it. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Isaiah. I, I, I think uh, for me what, what I'm excited about is that uh, I, I honestly think that Adeshina's dream uh, can become reality because it's very clear listening to the colleagues who have gone before us that the solutions are there. Uh, we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but it's very clear that if we're going to achieve impact, we probably need to connect in different ways. Um, I'm going to now invite uh, my, my panelists for a, for a discussion for the next 40 minutes. Uh, and uh, while we're doing that, I'll, I'll also try and uh, you know, pose some questions to the colleagues that presented earlier. So I'm first of all going to call our panelists to come up to the stage, and I'll start by um, inviting my brother, uh, Max uh, Olifot, uh, who is um, the, the, the director for programs um, for, for the East Africa Field Schools Hub uh, within the, the Africa Forum for Agricultural Advisory Services, AFAS. Thank you so much, my brother. You can take a seat. And then he's going to be joined uh, by... Um, uh, my other brother, Joshua <laughs> Okunya, uh, he's the program officer for agricultural technology and innovation uh, within the Association uh, for Strengthening Agricultural Research uh, in, ex in East and, uh, and Central Africa, Azareka. Uh, Joshua, if you could um, uh, join us as well. And then I'll, I'll end with uh, uh, my brother, Baiti uh, Fudisi. He's the, um, uh, the program coordinator uh, for CADAP uh, within um, our colleagues in, this in CADESA, which is the Center for Coordination of ag Agricultural Research uh, and Development in Southern Africa. But there are some questions that uh, came from, from the, the online audience. And by the way, we've got more than 44 people online that are following this uh, conversation right now. So we might look a bit small in the room, but our, bigger, our broader audience is actually big. There are some interesting questions. The first one, and I would like to throw this one uh, at uh, Lulz again in particular. Uh, Lulz, one of the colleagues online, Greg, is asking, uh, you guys seem to be pushing this fertilizer, fertilizer, fertilizer idea. Uh, what about organic uh, fertilizer solutions? What are you doing about that? Because it can't only be mineral fertilizers. What are you doing about, about um, you know, organic fertilizer? How do they fit into these solutions? Uh, thank, thank you. So I think because of uh, time constraints, maybe I was being fast. Otherwise, our advisory since last year has integrated organic inputs as well. So what we did is we have given alternatives or options for the farmers. If they have uh, adequate fertilizer for now, we recommend the specific amount for their plots. And if they have 50% of the inorganic fertilizer, and we have also provided options for organic. And if they don't have any fertilizer, 
we have also suggested what should they apply based on the local uh, local context. To recommend that organic, we did some surveys and analysis to determine what is available and how much can be used for the respective farmers. And still, one of the challenges was the availability of the, the you know, the for example, if you say compost, vermi compost, and so on. We need they have to first prepare, and that means we have to advise them earlier to to be uh, prepared for that uh, organic input uh, composition. So with the Ministry of Agriculture now, we are developing a roadmap or a policy document on how, which form of organic uh, agriculture in general can be proposed for Ethiopia based on global and national experience. So it is embedded in the DC support tool. I forgot to show the web link. Okay. If they see the website, they can see what is indicated there. Thanks. Okay. Can I ask maybe that uh, you pass the mic to Gizau? Gizau, I like the approach that you are taking around uh, not only looking at uh, the, the soil health or the soil fertility, but now embedding, you know, the issue of, uh, of, uh, of landscape. But even in your case, you are asking people to buy expensive fertilizer. Uh, why are you not also Im Im including, you know, uh, the organic uh, uh, solutions as well or taking an integrated soil fertility management approach? Yeah, I, I think that's very important uh, because we are talking about landscape, mm -hmm. and in the landscape, uh, we the the yield variability is because of the land degradation, and for that, uh, the response of inorganic fertilizer is not not uh, uh, very effective. So uh, we we need alternative solutions. So one of that is organic, not only organic, but uh, when we discuss with farmers, they have different options like. The cropping system is very important because most of the crop rotation uh, in Ethiopia, in the hilly slopes, they, they use different uh, diversities of crop uh, rotation. That is one thing. And another uh, is the, the land management. I mean, uh, it is also one of the components for, for maintaining the soil for long term uh, maintenance of the soil fertility. So in our case, I think we already launched the ICFP and Crealis at national level with the national research system. Uh, I think last year we have uh, we covered many areas, and this year we will continue. And from that database, and including the national uh, organic database, so we we can also have a very sp uh, location specific organic recommendation in each area. Fantastic! Thank you so much, uh, uh, Gizau. If you could maybe Shungu pass the you know the the microphone to my brother Baizi, uh, and then uh, let's let's hear from our colleagues who are, I think, working at um, you know at a sub-regional and continental uh, uh, perspective. I'll start with you, Baizi. Um, you you've heard, uh, I, I hope, some interesting solutions and advances. I, I suppose my first question to you is, uh, is is this scalable, uh, in your view? How does it support the CADA process? And how can the CADA process benefit from the kind of research that has been done by, by the colleagues here? Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you. And I also appreciate uh, for being invited to take part in this uh, important engagement. Yes, uh, I, I'm listening to the presentations, uh, the issues that have been uh, proposed, even the approach. I like the way that they were participatory. It means uh, the end users were part of the core creation, which is quite important for, for ownership. And um, I f uh, and personally, I feel the, the issues that were brought, the solutions, they are also very contemporary, as I've seen a lot of applications in terms of apps which are going to be used. As you, as you know, the majority of our, our population in the region are the youth and women. And I think this will speak especially to the youth if we want to bring them into the fold. I also uh, appreciate the fact that uh, we think what is what the uh, what what is being done actually is very relevant to us. As you know, we as coordinating agencies we rely on partnerships, and we have a long-running culture where we've been working closely with the CV centers. There are these regional integrated initiatives, for example, and with which. We try to uh, network with them because we promote the spillover of technologies. Uh, we have um, some strategic platforms through which we are able to take these important outputs and disseminate them. We do have our own um, uh, platforms, uh, whether through websites and 
B groups and so forth. But we also have a way of influencing the policymakers. For example, if I may highlight that, uh, we do have a, a forum, say, to talk to ministers because we have these input subsidy schemes, which are actually an impo important avenue through which you can force actually uh, farmers to take up certain technologies through incentives which are in, uh, mainstream through such subsidies. So I'm thinking the ideas that you are bringing forth are quite important. I like the the fact that they're also very location specific because one of the challenges that we have with these blanket recommendations which lead, lead to sometimes waste or the inappropriateness uh, of, 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 the, of the intervention. I, I don't want to exhaust the bag, but I'll, I'll have a chance to maybe uh, make some more inputs. But uh, I just wanted to highlight that indeed I can confirm that what is being proposed is relevant, especially that it was co-opted with the, the users and is exploring different avenues, looking even uh, into the, the social aspect of whether these things will be very acceptable and so forth. Thank you. Uh, Baiti, b before you hand over the mic to, to, uh, to, to Joshua, I, I, I would like to pick up the point you make around uh, the fertilizers or subsidy schemes. In your region, Southern Africa, I can name at least uh, three countries that have very large scale uh, fertilizer uh, subsidy schemes. Uh, Malawi, I think they call it FISIP, uh, and um, Zambia also has something called SIPISIP, and then in Zimbabwe, I think they call it uh, uh, FUMVUTSA or Command Agriculture, which are very large scale uh, programs delivering fertilizer to farmers. Now, what would it take, in your view, to make sure that the fertilizer distribution is driven by the science that these gentlemen uh, are talking about. Who, who needs to be spoken to? H how do we ensure that in Zambia, not only do you get your voucher, but your voucher tells us where you are located, and because of where you are located, the system immediately says this is the allocation that you get. Yeah, thank you. I think uh, we've reached a stage where because of technology and the, the coverage, say, of... Uh, telephony, such that the use of mobile phones and the like enable us to get a lot of data, uh, very convenient. But we know we have a challenge in the region where the our policy making not necessarily evidence-based. And uh, increasingly, we've been trying to say that the, the interface between our researchers and the scientists is, is quite weak. Uh, we there's this issue of the knowledge translation. Uh, often we get scientists, we gather and we talk to ourselves but the people that we need to reach he hardly comprehend what we are talking about. That we need to find a way in which we can break it down to make it understood by the public such that they can appreciate the value of this investment. Um, the for example, uh, I know recently, uh, I think last year in October, we convened a, a dialogue, a policy dialogue, which was centered around issues of access to fertilizer, especially in the advent of this uh, Ukraine-Russia conflict. And one of the issues that we brought about was the possible role of how input subsidies, especially uh, fertilizers. We know most countries are really underdosing because of sometimes the recommendations that are made. Uh, there are other implications behind why uh, politicians want to give out <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> subsidies. <laughs> so because of that, we are saying, can we increasingly, as technocrats, especially scientists, find a way in which we can come out on national radio, TV, and talk the language which these people can understand and increasingly engage the policy makers. We, in that dialogue, we also talked about organic solutions which are likely to be taking more center stage. We know a uh, lot of development partners who are embracing the issue of agroecology, and there are still some skeptics, but there, are, there is a volume of evidence that is out there. We just need to find a way of bringing it out to see how it can be part of the solution, not necessarily a silver bullet, because it takes a while even to build of the solution. Thank you. Uh, right, so thank you so much for that. And, uh, and I think you raise an important point that politicians want uh, respond to numbers, right? But if, uh, if, uh, if I heard Gizau, he's talking about 27% yield increase. And I think, Lulz, uh, you even went as high as 38% yield increase. I think that would be a happy electorate. And hopefully, we can get an opportunity through you, Baitsi, to, to maybe share some of these examples.
But let's shift to our innovation and technology guy in the room, and that's, uh, that's Joshua. Joshua, you saw there that, uh, you know, we are talking about machine learning, we are talking about, you know, using uh, 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 mobile applications and all these chatbots. Uh, from your experience as Azareka, uh, is that really scalable or these are, are nice fancy apps that we are developing that no one actually uses? Thank you very much, moderator. <laughs> Yeah, I would begin with a, a short answer that yes, these are scalable, but to who? I think when, what we when we are talking about farmers going forward, we need to define which farmer are we talking about. Yeah, we have a small scale farmers. Those those are maybe either have less than five hectares or one hectare, or depending on which country you are you are from, and then we have the semi commercial. And then, then you have the commercial who are a bit uh, economic and empowered. So with that semi-commercial and commercial farmers, those ones are, ab they are educated, they, yeah, they are literate, th they have the smartphone, they, can, they have large areas of, of production. They are able to use these digital, digital apps. So with, with that category and class of farmers, I think this absolutely is scalable and it works. Yeah, they are in places where there's internet coverage. They can afford the cost of 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 of, pe of, bu of, bu of buying data. Yeah, but when you come to the to the less than two hectare, less than five hectare farmers, I think who most of them are in rural areas without who are off grid without connection. They struggle to charge their phones if they do have them. Most of them have the the future sm button phones, non-smart. So it takes time to penetrate them using the, uh, the, the smartphone apps. Yeah, even the ones who have them are men, most of them are men. Yet the, the in that category of, of smallholder farmers, you find that majority are women. So you end up missing a, a certain proportion of the small scale, rural poor women farmers. So, so what could be the solution, uh, Joshua, in your I view? I think the solution going forward when you are developing, say, the apps, you shouldn't only lock yourself to the, plat to the smartphone platform. I think there are, the, there are other options of using SMSs to be able to reach out to them, or you identify, I would call them digital connectors, yeah? You have one trained uh, village-based extension worker who, who has a smartphone, and then this one communicates to to a group of of other farmers who have access who don't have access to to a smartphone. That way, is able to deliver the information e efficiently and effectively. W would you agree with the with this co thought that perhaps we are abandoning traditional methods like printable information too early? And that that might actually slow our ability to reach more farmers. I heard my colleagues speak about printable guides and so forth. Are we abandoning those uh, analog solutions too early? <laughs> depends on <laughs> depends on which culture you are you, you are working in. Yes, if you are, for example, if I would take a case for Uganda, uh, the northern eastern part of Uganda, where we have the the Karamoja region. I would say yes, we are abandoning it too early. We need to continue with the pictorials for the illiterate farmers. Yeah, you, p you continue with the pictorials, the displays. But what I've also found out that, which I think feels more digital, is that they, they, they record video messages and go out with the screen in the, in the village, they play music, and then they, they play video for, for them. Or in the video hall, usually every village has a video hall, so they do those mo the, the movies and they call the village and they are able to watch the, the advisor and extension information. So there the you don't abandon <laughs> yeah it's more of a, a, a hybrid yeah so you continue with the traditional yeah paper based extension service but also you bring on the vi the village based but not necessarily through the mobile app but through village speakers and screens. Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to bring Magdes in a little bit later to share a practical example from Digital Green. But I want to shift to 
my brother Max. Max, uh, you know, you you sit at the top of an organization that, uh, in my view, has got a huge task, right? If uh, if Afas fails, all these dreams that Adeshina was selling us are not going to happen because you are the people that are packaging and delivering advisory services. Now, a lot of what we've heard today is talking about this modern agronomy where we want site-specific, we want location-specific, we want timely advisory services. How on earth does uh, your network of members uh, you know, deliver things which are site specific, location specific, and timely. Wh wh what needs to change, or what are you already doing in that direction? Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, I start with the first of all little corrections. One, uh, I work for Afas as a director of programs, but the second one is a privilege based on my background. That's why I coordinate the East Africa Field School Hub. The reason is that my blood flows a lot of farmer field schools. So, that, uh, and uh, also, uh, just to remind our colleagues from the CGR, while I'm purely an occupation, my first job was in the SIP. So I am also a, a, grand, a grandson of the CGR. So, so I, I hope you heard what <laughs> Max is saying. He <laughs> is the Pope <laughs> of farmer field schools. <laughs> But he's also a grandson of the CG. So y please yes. so uh, no so I mark that, yeah. I talk from the mixed point of view. And um, just right, you, you mentioned, uh, I want to first r respond to something. In real extension world, in real way of reaching the farmer, there is no straight path. I think you have to innovate, navigate, and then come back to innovate with the farmers and then deliver the solutions together. And that's what makes the extension very unique. That's what makes um, scaling very unique because you get the solutions from the people you work with. So the way the architecture of AFAS is formed is that uh, AFAS as a, as a continent organization, of course, I'll go back to a very important speaker this morning who said three things, partnership, partnership, and partnerships. partnerships yeah. So uh, it's the same approach that we do um, at because we work with the SROs, we work with the FARA, we work with the CGR. At the same time, we, want we work with the farmers. And we cherish more the government because in every conversation that we go into, I think the government has a key responsibility of delivering services to its people. So some of us, the CGR, uh, the SROs, AFAS, we are complementing the government's efforts. Therefore, even the approach that we put, even the digital green that we have worked with uh, through the, um, the developing local capacities of extension, worked with you very closely. All this needs the government to be part of the equation for the reason I call institutionalization. Institutionalization. I've seen a number of uh, great approaches being done, but as we walk away, we go with them. So uh, this is a problem. The CGR, myself, uh, when I used to work with the field schools, when I went away, the field schools were starting to die the day I was leaving and the old women were saying, hey, when are you coming back? So the government has a driving force together with the farmers. So how does AFAS work? For us, we've set architecture in that we have AFAS as a continent organization with the secretariat, but we work with what we call the country fora. And the country fora bring together the, the so-called like-minded I love the word like-minded people who wish well extension and advisory services right from the researchers, public extension, private extension, farm organizations, media, and most importantly, the, farmer, the farmers themselves. So that is how we work. So how do you package this information? By involving these people as a platform. And, 
and and just just give me maybe an example there, Max, because uh, I, I like the fact that uh, you know you've you've done a lot of work uh, where you are making the information uh, easily consumable by farmers so that they can do something about it. Be because often, uh, if farmers see the result, then they will adopt, right? So how do we do it practically? Because uh, I've been cracking my head. I'm almost gray now, uh, trying to figure out how do we get this good quality information into as many hands as possible through the advisory networks that you support. So we have assembled them as a platform. How do we make sure first they've got good quality information, they are delivering it to the right farmer at the right time and we are also following up to see whether the farmer is implementing I, I think I, I would better give uh, a little bit of uh, an all the project we implemented with the CTA before CTA wound up what we call the the, the MUIS which was uh, bundling meaning you have agronomic practice you have weather information you have insurance you have uh, other elements. So in real world, we could call that embedded service in, in, to in, in the vocabulary of extension uh, or innovation, where you're going to the farmer, not in isolation, but you're talking about when do you plant, what is the, s the soil condition, when do you do a B, C, D, but in a bundle. So we've done that together with the, with the, with the NARO for Uganda, with Agra, we, we did that together with Agra, but also with the, the local government, so that we, we could go to um, northern Uganda, for example, uh, do what exactly uh, colleagues were talking about, have a profile of a farmer, and you know precisely where this farmer is, you can geo-reference and be able to tell where this farmer comes from, but also you have a clue of the, the geography, but also the, the, the climatic conditions within the area about five kilometers radius of that farmer. So when you are giving the advice, you are really almost precisely giving a fair advice to this farmer on SMS, but you don't stop there. You have some of these at least extension people who interpret the challenge sometimes is to send somebody information, then you stop and think the person is understanding the information as you do. That is a small mistake we do as a development uh, practitioners. But you also need, uh, even if it is a farmer, there are farmers who have progressively developed their capacity to be able to fill the gap of an extension worker. So that farmer becomes uh, a pivotal point who will interpret the information for the rest of the farmers. Otherwise, if you send, the information sent to this room will be interpreted differently by different people. Even if you draw here a head of uh, a duck and that of uh, a rabbit, and you ask this very high <laughs> professional, <laughs> some of them may say it is a rabbit, others will say it is uh, a duck. And that is what happens with the information that we send to the farm. We need also to follow up this yes. information. Yes. And what my minister recently uh, called standardizing messaging of a device to the farmer. Correct. I, I, I think, I think uh, you'll agree with me when Mark says he's the Pope of farmer field schools. That comes from uh, experience what he's talking about. That it's not really just about giving people information. We need to make sure they've heard it well and they're able to interpret it. Barbara, could you just help me get give the microphone to make this? I want to pick up something, because Max made a point, and I think uh, you know Joshua made the same point, that how do we make these things sustainable? You know, you're coming with these nice uh, systems of video, uh, advisory in the farms. What happens when the money dries up? How do we make sure it carries on? Please sh share your experience. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm very glad that most of the things we have been doing uh, are mentioned by the panelists as a way forward. Yes, basically the farmers do not have access to the gadgets, and if they have the gadgets, they don't have the access to, to the airtime. 
And there is always a difficulty when we use digital technologies. So at Digital Green, what we are using is community videos. The community videos are produced by the farmers, and it's for the farmers. The farmers are featuring whatever is should be promoted as a good practice or a technology. And that video, uh, facilitated by the development workers, frontline workers, facilitated by them, will be screened to the um, to group of farmers so that they understand the process, hear it from kind of person who they can relate to, the farmer. Mostly if we get women farmers who are good and acceptable by the others, we feature uh, women farmers as well so that the other women fellow farmers could relate and aspire to be like them. So the adoption rate from the information or the advisory uh, contents shared through the videos is accepted by the farmers with huge difference uh, as compared to the kind of the extension system which is customary by the S doing it face to face or moving from place to place. A so that's th one thing. Mm -hmm. And the other, yes, uh, you mentioned about institutionalization. Um, uh, as NGO, we are NGO, so whatever technology or practice we bring to the communities might not be sustainable if it is not embedded within the existing system. So whatever we do, we do with the Ministry of Agriculture functionaries up from the ministry up to the Gabale level, local level. So we train the government people, the local development agents, as well as the um, subject matter specialists who know um, who know what is what should be uh, provided as an advisory to the farmers. So the government people will produce the videos featuring the farmers, and that's facilitated by the DS. They will be provided by um, equipment will be provided initially by the, by the project, but now the government has owned that process, and it is being part of the extension system, and the government is investing on that. So it's part of now. It's I can. Mm, confirm that it's part of the extension system. And we are working to kind of scale it all over the country. Currently, we are working in five regions with the government. And they are working like to scale it to the country at large. So scaling with the government is very critical to sustain impact. I, I really think, thanks, Bob, because I want to come back to Raiti now. Uh, I really like the, the point you make, make this around you, you need to scale with farmers, but you also need to scale with the government. Uh, and I think that's important. Someone online by it is, is really wanting to learn a bit more about these policy dialogues. Uh, from, a, from the outside looking in, people say, but politicians or, or technocrats never listen to scientists anyway. What do you think we need to do to really get the message across? Let's be practical. Zimbabwe has a, a fertilizer scheme that reaches over 1.5 million farmers. Zambia, a similar number. Malawi, a similar number. How do we embed this technology that we are talking about through this uh, 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 scheme? Is, is it really only about the policy dialogues, or is there something else that we must do? Yeah, I think, uh, as I mentioned, uh, scientists they need to find a way of marketing what they do. Uh, as Max was saying, we should not always assume people understand us. Therefore, there's this element of advocacy that we need to deploy. I, and I know NGOs are very good at this because uh, say, for example, us as Cadesa, we work with uh, the diversity of stakeholders. We are supposed to be seen to be working not only with the government sector, but we work with NGOs. I recall uh, recently, we are working with ActionAid, where they did a study on the financing of agroecology. Uh, they set up a platform to talk to such uh, a portfolio committee, which is for agriculture and trade. And we came in to, I mean, to present together to the parliamentarians. So the issue of advocacy, we need to put it into use to so that we can continue messaging what we are doing. I mean, it sometimes it doesn't happen overnight. It can be a process. We need to also learn the science. Just as much as we have to market technologies, we need to find a way in which we can find a way of reaching through to politicians. I know we talk of um, doing policy briefs or just finding a mechanism of communication which actually our politicians can be able to listen to us. You know, the sometimes we write very elaborate uh, documents which nobody reads. Uh, 
uh, uh, I mean, I know right now, if you were to go into pharma groups, farmers are sharing so much information, especially through WhatsApp. I have literally, I mean, joined some groups, I just listen. Sometimes you see very wrong information being disseminated, but uh, at the same time, there's very good information for those farmers who are well-versed with what they are doing. And these are some of the avenues that, and farmers also have strong influence, especially on politicians. If we get farmers on our side, particularly on the right things, they can actually bring about the change and make the politicians listen because they can demand what they want. Thank you. Brilliant. So I, see, I, think, I think you've really hit the nail on the head. One of the things that we need to do as this community is to communicate better. But maybe uh, I need to add that we probably need to coordinate better. And that's why I want to now shift to my brother Joshua to say, well, this coordination, you guys as an SRO uh, are doing a lot of that. How do we then make sure that the coordination results into action uh, in all your constituent members? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. How do we ensure that the coordination results into action? Well, <laughs> yeah, partnerships. Yeah, we need to ensure that we have effective partnerships with the, the, the different players and the we find activities to to bring to life the the f the, the memorandum of understanding the agreements that we have. So if we have an MOU for example with the the the, the initiative for agronomy, we need to for example do resource mobilization activities together win some money and then imp implement projects together. In that way, we are able to build the trust, but as well as deliver on the on the key outs. Because we can always talk, but if we don't have money to answer and solve the solutions, to, to, to give solutions to the problems at hand, then we, we are not causing any, or we can't see any impact on the ground. Agreed. So I, I feel that that is very key, that to, to have action, we need to to have activities that we do jointly. But also, we need to be able to identify needs. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm also, <laughs> I didn't tell you my background, but I've been with IITA, I've been with SIP, International Pilotal Center, so I'm also a, a CG product. But we, we tend to, as researchers, one and 2.1, that we we tend to communicate to ourselves, we write technically. We hardly, even if you organize a policy dialogue, you hardly get the politicians in the house. Even if you, go, you got them into the house, into the dialogue, they will stay there for 30 minutes and over an hour and then they will be gone. So what's this that we are failing to get the attention or the eye of the politicians? I think we don't speak to their needs. We need to identify what are their needs? How does this science that we are doing contribute to the needs of the politician? How do they speak to each other? Exactly. Are we answering to the politician's need? If you are able to demonstrate that, that by use of this technology, what's your problem? First of all, you are the politician. So if you use this technology, this is the impact that you are going to have, and then you have it, it, it will answer, yeah, it will meet your needs. Correct. So I think we need to begin with ensuring that we understand the, the problem yeah. of, the, of the farmers or of the politicians. Even if it's for farmers, the technology, is it a problem that, for example, the, the soybean yield is low? Is this the farmer's problem? Are you sure it's the farmer's problem? It's good to say there is a yield gap. Yes. Is it necessary to cover that yield gap anyway? Yeah. Yeah. Because there is return on investment, yeah. if you are able to demonstrate that for for use of fertilizer, like, like in potato, yeah, I've in potato in Uganda, I think potato is more the commercial crop, and there is use of input, high input, yeah, pesticides and um, and fertilizer. But farmers have no problem to to buy the fertilizers; they have no problem to do routine application of of pesticides. Even if it's costly, yeah. why? Because potato is a high value crop. They are sure when they plant it, there is a, there will be a big profit margin at the time they are selling. Come to see potato. They are not willing to invest into 
Yeah, those uh, IPM and mm. historic particle management. Because the 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 the, 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 the profit margin is, is very limited. low. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So we if if a crop has market, we need to begin you know, science has done a lot from the production side. Yeah. But we need to invest into the the demand side. So that we call we create a pull effect. Yeah. That alone will drive farmers to inputs and increase production, increase yield, close the yield gap, even without your intervention. Just show them this is where the market is for this crop, for your yield. They will produce for sufficient quantities, even a crop that will dry. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. Now I want to I want to move to uh, to you, Max, and uh, I, I see we've been joined by one of our guests. But Max, I, I I wanted you to answer this question to say. If we were to put together a toolkit uh, to help, uh, you know, the advisor, the advisor community out there, to better deliver, you know, these uh, climate uh, sensitive advisories, uh, which can help farmers become resource efficient, what would you include in that toolkit? What do you think uh, the the network of advisors needs in their toolkit? to better deliver on the objective that we have set here? Uh, it is quite a, a very difficult question, but again, it comes back to, in the toolkit, we, what do we want to deliver? Whom do we want to deliver that thing to? And why do we need to deliver that? Uh, so uh, it, it gets back to the incentivization element. Correct. Why are we putting all our minds into this toolkit? And for that reason, I think uh, I would say, if really we're talking about agronomic practice that is re giving us climate resilience and in terms of the resource efficiency and uh, a farming system. Now that, that goes back to what we are talking about, a system. So therefore, the researcher, education worker, number one, need to talk very closely. Remember, these are people who should have an idea of how they work together with the farmers. And along the conversation in the toolkit, you need, when we bring the farmer, we need to bring the other actors like the private sector, who eventually has an idea of economics of this agronomic practice, is going to increase the yield by 3% or by 60%. And at that point, we need to put the other avenues, the other infrastructure, the other architecture right. There are instances when we've increased the yield by 70%, but you remain with your produce rotting. And I know this in, 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 in areas where there are citrus growers, oranges, at the period you have a lot of oranges that are just falling over the trees and nobody is taking them. Your toolkit is not a good toolkit anymore. But what we need is to add these private sector guys on board in this toolkit. What is their niche? How are they helping? And in fact, when we talk about digitalization, the private sector drives digitalization more than anybody, more than government. Government will drive digitalization in terms of security, but the private sector will drive it in terms of business to make money, and uh, the digital green teams will be very keen to work with the private sector because the private sector will invest to ensure that they make money out of the agronomic practice that we put into the hands of the farmer. So the toolkit is a mirage of many things. It is going to be, again, a multi-stakeholder platform toolkit with a lot of things but well thought with the correct context. I think that's brilliant Max. Uh, I'll summarize it as follows that I think you spoke about the toolkit must have good quality information. It must have the right partnerships around the table. It must assemble incentives that make sense for farmers and ultimately it must be delivery focused with clear results that farmers can respond to. I think to be fair to uh, my brother, <laughs> uh, Dr. Emmanuel, am I right? Uh, that uh, has just joined us. I, I would like to give you the last word. 
uh, from, a, from, a, from your perspective to say, how do we better organize ourselves to deliver uh, on, the, on the mandate that we were given yesterday to make sure that each and every farm on the African continent is getting the information, is got the right incentives, and they are able to see real results on their farms going forward from this partnership. You've got two minutes to wrap up. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. I'm sorry to be late. You know, I had a conflict, conflicting agenda. There was a session that I was chairing. I'm Emma Benjuke. I'm the Director of Research and Innovation. I'm happy to meet uh, Murad. <laughs> I just saw he's behind the house empty. Uh, you know, we are willing to make use of all this technology and go up operate in Western Central Africa in 23 countries. But the technology we should define, how, what is the technology, how it works, and what category of stakeholder, and the cost of the technology. I don't know if this has been actually dealt with. I would want to share an experience. I was in Nigeria. We, I met some ladies. They said they were trained, and they were talking about household nutrition. They said, uh, Emmanuel, they told us one NGO said boil, boiling of banana is not good. You know, the nutrient quality and quantity are diminishing. Yeah, some other group comes and say, oh, frying of banana is not good. Then another person will come and say, oh, boiling is not good, you know. Then they're now asking us, how do we, how do we now consume banana? So the communication has to be where we really have to work more. And I'm happy we are in uh, one CG where the voice is now one, I, I imagine. Yeah. So what we are communicating should be really factual and uh, can make sense. You know, if they tell you you can't boil banana, you can't fry banana, uh, you know, then how do you eat it? <laughs> so that's the thing. <laughs> you can't roast, so it becomes challenging. Uh, I'm happy that we are here on this. And uh, as I earlier mentioned, the words that are really catchy, you know, the resilient is good. And uh, we're talking about uh, resource efficiency. I also have a case when I was working with uh, Murat we were in Burundi. You know, water harvesting is very important. We talk about climate change. A farmer harvests uh, water, then unfortunate he used the water to water his crop. Then two hours later, it rains. The farmer starts crying. That is a waste. You have spent time to store water, then you use the water. Two hours later, there's rain, you see? So the, the, you can imagine the type of effort you are put in to conserve the water, then you use it, then it rain falls natural rain, natural water rain. So there should be a mechanism to actually digitalize, as uh, Bag really said, and also information system where farmers should have an information that can guide, uh, and you know, foresight. You tell them, please, by tomorrow or next tomorrow, there must be rain. So if they're harvesting water, they should know that the water I've harvested, I shouldn't waste it. Because once you use it and then it rains, then they consider it as waste. So communication to me is one. Uh, coordination, I'm happy we are in 1CG. And irrespective as we are 1CG, I was discussing with uh, Dr. Atakri, I don't know if he's here. We, we, we still go around receiving a lot of the centers coming for contractual agreement. So I said, but you are married. You will have to have one agreement to the regional office. But, you know, I don't know I, how we're going to do the magic so that the, 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 the approach or the, 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 the reform that we are putting in place be, uh, be effective and efficient. Because some of the centers are still pushing their technologies independent of the others. But I think if we go through, you know, a centralized system where they can now identify which of the center is appropriate in doing this, that will be good for us. Thank you. Uh, I, I thank you for all the opportunity, and I'm sorry to be late. I was chairing another of the <laughs> side event somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. Th thanks, Dr. Emmanuel. And, uh, and as I wrap up, uh, I'm glad you've raised the issue of coordination. Uh, and I, Because you come from West Africa, that's why you win all the soccer matches in Africa, because you are better coordinated, you know? So, so you are raising the point of, uh, of, uh, of coordination. The city that is hosting us, uh, Deben, I is known for sports. Uh, it's the home of, uh, you know, one of the most successful rugby franchises, but it's also home of one of the oldest football clubs in South Africa. In sports, it's always important to have a game plan. Uh, what are we playing for? Is it for a draw? Is it for survival? Or we have no choice but to win this, this game? 
whatever the game plan, it's important to ensure that we have all the best players in the room and how best we are using them to win. So what I would like to say to all of us is, what is our game plan? How are we organizing ourselves? Are we clear about how we are going to reach this goal of a modern uh, agronomy, which is driving climate resilient and resource efficient farming systems? That's the task that we were given yesterday, and that's the task that we must succeed in. Ladies and gentlemen, online and here, thank you so much for your time. Really looking forward to further collaboration going forward. Thank you.